we are live on the Frugal Crafters YouTube channel. I'm Lindsay, the Frugal Crafter, and with me today is my husband, Jason. Hi, everybody. And uh, he is going to be taking your questions. So um, we're going to look at a bunch of different watercolor brushes. If you guys want to see something demoed, if you have a question about a brush as we go along, please let me know. And um, we will uh, we'll look at my personal brush collection, which is quite uh, extensive. These are not my teaching brushes. Those I keep separately because they'd be pretty boring because it's 20 of the same thing. Um, but uh, but we'll, uh, we'll go through here. Ah, if you have questions, you can type the word QUESTION in all caps, and then um, if it's something that's, uh, that's super easy that one of our moderators knows and they can just rattle off an answer for you, that's uh, they'll do that. But if it's something um, pertaining to what I'm doing here, Jason will ask that question to me and I will answer it for you live. If you're watching this in the replay, then um, enjoy. Uh, you can leave comments if you have any questions after the fact. So um, I just put these pictures down here for so I could focus my camera and white balance and whatnot. But um, I did this last night while I was sorting all of my brushes because there was some I wanted to test out as I went. And I found one of my favorite brushes that I thought I lost probably about 15 years ago when I was moving from my studio downtown uh, to work in my home studio because I was expecting my twins. And um, this is a cat's tongue. And it is, uh, it's got a flat ferrule, but it comes to a point. So if I get it wet, you can see it comes to a beautiful point there. And uh, the reason I like this brush so much is because you can get really fine lines or you can press and get really wide lines and you can vary from a thin to thick and to thin again. So it's just a nice expressive brush. And I've never found one to buy that's quite as nice. I did get a Princeton cat's tongue brush um, a few years ago, but it was never quite as nice and responsive as this one. So I was so happy to have found it when I uh, reorganized last night. And um, I thought I would also start by showing you my first ever watercolor brushes because if you get a good watercolor brush and you take care of it, it will last you a lifetime. I got this brush here, these three when I was seven years old. This is a half inch Alvin, A-L-V-I-N, um, 8046 Golden Taclon. And you probably see a lot of golden Taclon brushes. And back then, this brush was $20. Brushes have come down a lot in price over the decades. Um, so this is quite an investment for a seven-year-old. And um, or for my mother to make on a seven-year-old. And then I have this um, size zero Robert Simmons mop. And this number eight Robert Simmons round. So then that's pretty much what I did. I also had this number six Grumbacher golden Taclon. But I, I can't find it. And I just laid eyes on that recently. So I don't know where that ended up. It's probably mixed in with a different mediums brushes. So we'll have to look for that. But I uh, just wanted to show you that your brushes can last forever. And if you invest in good brushes for your kids and you teach them how to care for them, they can uh, they can keep them forever. Do you have a question or? Yeah, there's a few on there. Sure. Uh, Clarice is asking what's your favorite liner slash detail brushes are? Um, I don't use too many detail brushes. I just recently got this little uh, set though. This is a pseudo sable from Cheap Joe's Art Stuff. It's the Joe Miller pseudo sable. And I got the travel set that has four brushes. And, um, but honestly, the number 12, the tip on the number 12 will come to such a fine point that, um, that I can actually get a really fine line from this if I use it straight up and down. But then I can also get a really wide wash if I want to use it on its edge. Um, but there are also smaller brushes in here. The smallest one, I believe, is a number four, but I don't find it gets finer than this. I do like um, the Creative Mark Mimic Liner, and that is in with my rounds, which we are going to go through first. So I will just grab that. So my favorite detailer would probably be, and granted, I don't really use brushes that are super duper tiny, would be this number two round from Mimic by Creative Mark, available on Amazon or Jerry's Artorama. So you can check both places and see which is the better deal. Jerry's Artorama sells them both at Amazon and in their store, so you know you can check prices. But um, I've used this one a lot, and I find it still has a nice sharp point. And you know it is pretty. You can get pretty. You know you can get fairly fairly wide with it as well. So that would be my favorite. Um, I probably don't go smaller than that, but I also have the liner. And these were both in the um, value pack set, but you can buy them individually. And they have a try it where I think you can get two. There's two um, Creative Mark 
brushes for like a couple bucks and I think that number two might be one of them. So I like those two. I also tried a Masters Touch liner and that one was really good too, a size zero. And this is a number two liner. I found the Masters Touch Zero to be the same size as the Creative Mark number two. So those would be my favorites. Um, I don't know if they're small enough for you, but there you go. And, and someone asked if uh, Stacy Brister, do you still think the Gray Mimic brush set's the best choice for the first your first real set? Oh yeah, absolutely. I don't think you can beat the value of that. You get such a variety of paint brushes. Um, it can be, I think it's a great, a great deal and it usually is under $30 to get that set. So that would definitely be my best pick for a beginner set. Uh, they have just enough snap to go back to shape when you're painting, um, but they're absorbent enough to hold plenty of water. So absolutely. Uh, so these are my round brushes. I think I'm just going to go ahead and dump them on my paper here. Move this out of the way. Get my sketchbook out of the way here and forgot to, to turn the ringer off on the phone, of course. Oh, there's so many of these. Maybe I shouldn't have dumped it out. Maybe I should have just pulled out a few select ones. My sister got me this vase and I thought it'd be really great for my round brushes because I use them more than anything. And then I could put a few of my, the ones I use the most, I could put in one of these like little, uh, little holes on the side so that I can easily access them. In fact, those two will go in one of those side holes there. So um, probably my, my biggest recommendation um, would be the Mimic brushes. This is a 30. These all come in the value set along with a, another one, which might be in my upstairs brushes. It also comes with a number four, which is um, a little bit bigger than this, and a flat, which and two flats. And I'll show you those when we get to the flat brushes. Um, but yeah, this is a great set. This is completely faux fur. Um, the technology nowadays for creating really good brushes out of synthetic materials is um, is wonderful. So if you're looking to avoid animal products in your painting, I highly recommend this set. Even if you're not, I mean, to get a brush, heck, to get a brush this size in like a sable would probably cost you over $30. So, you know, you really, you just can't beat it. Um, I also have, oh, and I want to offer a tip that if you happen to leave your brushes in the water too long and the, the barrel uh, swells and the paint cracks and the ferrule gets loose. And that's what happened here to this one. This is the Mimic Kalinsky, which is a faux Kalinsky fur brush. I actually ordered another one because I do work for Jerry's Artorama and, um, and I didn't want to show a busted up brush in my demos. So I ordered a new one. But um, if that happens to you, uh, pull the end off, sand off the loose paint, and then use either glossy accents or gallery gloss or any really strong waterproof glue. Brush it over the flaking paint and all the way up into the end of the, the handle and then put a few drops in the ferrule and then push it together and let it dry and it will take care of the wiggly brush problem and give you use out of your brush. Uh, of course, it's not gonna look perfect because you left your brushes in the water and they swelled and cracked, but it will give you a usable brush again. Um, so the this is another great option if you want a stiffer brush, um, not quite as stiff as a, as a Taclon, but absorbent like a Kalinsky Sable, springy like a Sable, but without um, the fur, the Mimic Kalinsky Sables are a great bet. They're more expensive than the Mimic um, Squirrels, and I personally like the like the handling of the squirrel, the faux squirrels better. But um, but these are available too if you feel like you want a le slightly less absorbent, slightly more springy brush, and uh, these are available in a value pack also as individuals. Um, but I'll show you those. Actually, I could show you them side by side. I think I have the same size as an each. Let's see, that's an eight. These are both eights here. We'll show them side by side. I'm gonna set this out of the way, just so you can see the difference. And also grab an, an eight Taclon, so you can kind of see that as well. That's a 10 Taclon. That's a 10 Taclon. And you'll see that sizes can vary a little bit between uh, between brushes. I mean, not, not a ton, but there is gonna be some variation. These both say they're tens and one looks a little bit bigger to me. Oh, here we go. And so I've got an eight in Royal Majestic, which is another wonderful brush. I've got an eight in a Mimic Squirrel and I've got an eight in um, the Mimic Kalinsky. So let's first use the Mimic Kalinsky. This was gonna be probably in between, in performance wise, in between these. I'm just gonna pick up some red paint. So we can try line depth here. I can uh, line width. I'll start straight up and down, get a fine line, press a little bit more, get a wide line, reload, 
my brush and do kind of like a side swipe. So you get a good uh, variety of line there. And I could do a little comma stroke so you can see how it handles. So pretty good for handling. Do an S stroke so you can see that. So very responsive, easy to handle. That is the um, Mimic Sable. This is the Mimic, I mean, this is the Majestic, which is a synthetic Taclon, which would be like if you were buying a, an acrylic painting brush with golden hair, that would be that type of material. I'm gonna grab it in that same color so we don't have any difference with viscosity of paint or characteristics there. And these are all pointed rounds. So over here, we'll do a, get a little hair on the end. We'll do a straight fine line. Won't do that again. Oh, I have a little puddle, uh, puddle of color. So we got our straight line. We'll do a full line. So it's not quite as wide as that. And I'm gonna add some more color to it. And then we'll do a side wash here. So the, the bristles don't hold quite as much water and they don't spread out quite as much when you're painting. But I actually, if you're using student grade paints and um, you want a, a set of brushes for a beginner, I like the Royal Magnical Majestics because they don't hold too much water. And if you're using student grade paints, sometimes you have trouble by putting too much water in and then you can't get the pigment as strong as you want. And then I'm gonna do my favorite here, which is the Mimic uh, Squirrel. Again, with that same color. And I'm going to do a straight line. I'm going to do a wide line. And then I'll do a side wash here. So you can see you get pretty much the same results on any number eight brush. It's just whatever you prefer working with. Um, the differences are so subtle that you might not notice um, as a beginner, but as you, you know, develop the way you like to work, some are going to just feel more natural for you. Now I'm gonna look to see if I have a, um, an actual authentic number eight sable brush. I don't know if I do. Oh, actually I do. This is one I got about 20 years ago. So this would be an actual fur brush. So I, I was, when I first, um, probably the first, until I was probably in my mid twenties, I really didn't think about the materials that my brushes were made out of. Um, because you buy a brush and you'd have it forever with watercolor. Um, so I do have some sable brushes because of that. So this is a Richardson um, Pure Kalinske sable and up on its tip. Now this has been used a lot, so it could have lost some of its um, point over the years. That's the, you could see the fullness of the belly if I when I press how much wider that is versus that and that. Um, because the bristles are natural hair, they can just they can just absorb a little bit more. Now the side wash has a lot to do with how long your bristles are. So there's not that much difference between the side wash and my full belly of the brush there. So just to kind of give you an example. Now you're gonna notice this. Oh, we got a question. Oh, there's a few in here. Okay, the moderators sure. have been getting a bunch of them, thankfully, because I sure wouldn't know what to answer. But um, <laughs> how can you decide if a brush is for watercolor or for acrylics, or the differences? Yeah, well, if you're if you're ordering, um, usually if you're buying in a shop or you're ordering online, they do tell you what the brushes are for. Um, usually, well, if it's a long handled brush, generally it's not going to be for watercolor. However, I have these two Cotman brushes, which are by Winsor & Newton, and they are for watercolor. And the reason the handles are so long is to balance the brush so that it's, it's going to be more... Um, more comfortable to paint with but generally when you're buying it on like the rack that it's in will say watercolor or if you're buying online it will say watercolor or it'll say recommended for and it may be recommended over different materials uh like for different mediums so um you just you just read when you buy and it should tell you what it's for what if you inherited a bunch of brushes oh well try them <laughs> try them with all your medias and see what you like best because you know there's no rule that you have to use a brush with oils or watercolor or whatever you can use them with whatever you want um, Watercolor brushes tend to be softer and they tend to be more absorbent. Acrylic brushes are a little bit stiffer for pushing around stiffer paint. And acrylic brushes that are meant for, um, that are meant for like toll painting are gonna be softer than ones that are meant for using heavy body acrylics. And oil painting brushes are stiffer still to push around the rich uh, viscous oil paint. So um, you match the bristles to what media you're using. Someone had asked if you ever used uh, bamboo brushes 
Yes, I have there. I don't really care for them that much because um, they just don't go for, with my style of painting. I did find a few. I thought I'd taken them all down to the library to use in my kids' classes, um, but I did find a few. They're just not, um, and I have real cheap ones that came in like kits, but they just never really, um, really uh, were my cup of tea. So these brushes are not pointed rounds. They're around, but they don't come to a particular point. So if you look at this Cotman brush, and I remember buying this at North Light Books in Blue Hill, Maine, but you can do a heck of a beautiful big comma stroke with it. So you see how when you press down with that brush, you get a very rounded edge versus if you're gonna use like a pointed round, like the um, like the Majestic I was just showing you, if you press down, you're gonna get a more of a point on your end. You're not gonna get that smooth rounded edge. So that's something you also might wanna look at when you're going to paint something, say it's a daisy petal, you might want something with, a, with not a point on the end of your round. So there's, you know, there's uses for everything. Um, and I found that I didn't use this brush all that much, but I think I will now that I see how well it handles. Um, so these would be rounds, but not necessarily pointed rounds. These are from the Cotman line. These are all Taclon and these are marketed to beginners because they're meant to go with their Cotman lines of paints, which are student grades. So you wouldn't want a super soft brush. You'd want a brush with a little bit of push so it can stir up those pigments when you're working. Do you use shaders a lot? Uh, flats, I don't use them as much as rounds, but I do, and we will get to the flats in a second. Um, I am going to just look through here and see if there's anything uh, remarkable to show you. Um, so this is a type of liner. It's a pretty big one. It's a number four Princeton Neptune, and a liner is different from a round because of the length of the bristles. So this has nice long bristles, so I know that if I go to paint with this, I can pretty much paint for days because I've got those long bristles that will hold tons of paint. Now they're not going to, um, you're not going to have as much control because those long bristles will want to flop back and forth, but you will get, um, you'll get lots of long lines. So they're great for grasses, telephone wires, um, riggings on a boat, anything like that. And I have some other liners here too. Was there another question? Yeah. Uh, Bugging out 45 asks, when you're painting and you want a looser style, do you select a certain type of brush bristle or is it the size of the brush that helps it be looser? It's both. A bigger brush is going to be looser um, and also a softer brush is going to be looser and it will hold more paint so you don't end up fussing around with a small area. If you can hold more paint you can paint looser and longer because you're not always dipping it uh, in water. So just another variety of um, faux fur brushes. These are faux squirrels. These are Princeton Neptunes and Mimic uh, Menta brushes. I'm sorry, a Royal and Line Nickel Menta. These brushes have just been released and they are very affordable. They retail for about $5 and they go on sale um, at AC Moore anyway. So um, these are probably the best, the best buy out of these brushes if you're looking to get started for less. Um, so for $5 versus about $20 for this faux squirrel that is um, by Princeton, the Princeton Neptune line, which is also really good. So pretty much these are all just different versions of those brushes I just showed you. Um, so your brushes will be either made from natural hair or synthetic hair. And out of the synthetics, they can be um, meant to act just like natural hair, or they may be a little gold shinier, like white or golden tacklon, and less absorbent, but more springy. So you can determine what you like best when you're painting and go from there for selecting your brushes. Also, some of your brushes will be a blend. This is a Scepter Gold by Windsor & Newton. This is a mixture of Kalinsky Sable and Synthetic. And sometimes they do that because, well, it brings the cost down, but it also gives you the best attributes of both. So you have got the water holding and paint holding ability of the, um, the natural animal hair, but then you also have the snap. See how that brush came right back to a straight line? It didn't bend over. You get that, um, the snap of the synthetic. So that's, those are what the blend brushes are. They're a mixture and that's why they mix them up. Someone has a question about Craftum, Craftum brushes, that brand. Have you ever used that no, brand? No, I've uh, never heard of it. They had one they liked, but the hair, there's a hair keeps coming loose. It's bugging them. Oh no. Is it, I wonder if it's falling out or if it's just sticking out from the side. Oh, I don't know. They said coming loose. But. Hmm. I would try to pluck it out. Um, and if that doesn't work, then, um, then I, I would try wetting it, like putting it in hot water and then putting some soap on your fingers and trying to mold it back into shape and let it dry and that might help. 
Um, now, there's also brushes that are designed for toll painting, which is a type of acrylic painting where you use a bottled acrylic, which is really thin. Those brushes work really well for watercolors, especially if you want detail brushes. Um, this is a Laurel Cornell Comfort. These brushes are really wonderful. They're uh, Taclon and uh, they work really well. They're very um, responsive and comfortable to work with. So that's also something to consider. They're oftentimes a lot less expensive than brushes marketed to artists. You go for the ones marketed to crafters and toll painters. Have you ever used silver black velvet brushes? I haven't, but I've heard they're really excellent. They're another uh, faux squirrel brush. getting all these situated and we'll go to flats next and I'm gonna get rid of this paper this is just drawing paper that I'm practicing on here you got a couple hundred people watching looks like oh that's excellent oh one other thing I wanted to show you guys because I had a few people ask me about this on Instagram uh, this is a Buddha board and what this is like say you you're new to painting or maybe you're you're studying um, calligraphy or brush lettering or sumi e or something where you want to practice your brush strokes where you need that control this is a little collapsible um, little kind of like easel thing you can put it up like that if you want to although if you're doing brush lettering you probably want it flat but it comes with a brush, but you can also use any brush you have as long as it's clean and you just use it with water and you can, um, you can practice your brush strokes and get used to handling your brush. And then when it dries, it's clean and you just do it again. So it's a reusable slate that you can, um, you can practice with, which is really handy if you're beginning and you don't want to waste a bunch of paper. You can also do this on like a brown bag. Any colored paper will act pretty much the same, but it will deteriorate where the Buddha board will, um, will bounce back every time. Penny wants to know what brushes are needed for your flower class. Um, for the flower class, your basic brushes, um, if you have that mimic value set, that's wonderful. We also use a deer foot stippler, um, a dagger, and I'm going to be adding a section on the wedge brush, um, but in a or a flat and an angle. If you don't have a dagger, you can use an angle, um, and you can always try the lesson with because I give options. Like if you don't have a dagger, use a flat, um, and then you can see if you really want to add that to your collection or not. But you know, a few rounds. Um, I'd say a half inch flat, one inch flat. A dagger if you have it, a deer foot stippler if you have it, or take an old round brush and, and cut it and you can make your own deer foot stippler. All right, next we have flats. I don't think I'm going to dump them out this time. I think I'll just uh, pull out a few highlights. Uh, again, they are made out of the same materials that your rounds would be. Oftentimes with your flats, though, you're going to see um, some white hair brushes, some really soft ones. I don't recommend these um, for watercolor because they tend to shed an awful lot. Um, a lot of times the, the soft white goat hair is meant for Chinese painting. Um, and a lot of watercolor is Susie's, but I find them to be um, kind of a pain to deal with. And you may have some in like Chinese painting kits or whatnot. They're so absorbent, but they're also very floppy. They don't hold their shape and they shed. So I would not recommend those. Um, you can also have squirrel hair, camel hair, pony hair, but they're generally just, um, just different versions of, um, of like a squirrel or ferret type of hair. Um, and those are byproducts. The, the squirrel um, type brushes, those are byproducts of the fur industry. And that's why I avoid them um, other than the ones I already have in my collection. So with flats, what you're looking for when you have a, when you have a flat is you want a brush that's going to have a nice chisel edge. So when you wet it, you want those bristles to kind of come together in a nice um, straight fine point. You don't want um, paint brushes, those bristles to be sticking out everywhere. So when you load it up and you paint with it, you want to have, you know, nice, crisp lines. Now these brushes will have different lengths. So this is a fairly long one. You'd probably call this a one stroke. Uh, there are shorter ones that you'd call a wash or a bright, depending on how short it is. Generally, like this would be a wash. This one's labeled as a bright, but that's not super short. I have some that are even shorter that would illustrate a bright a little bit better. Um, and this is the Royal Sable Tech, which is an imitation sable that Royal and Landnickel make. They have quite a few new imitation sables out. This is a good example of a one stroke. If you can see how long those bristles are, that's good for sign painting or anytime you want to make a lot of really long, long lines. 
Were there any other questions already? Um, the moderator is catching an awful lot of stuff. Oh, good. Here. Very helpful. You can see how you could do ribbons or a lot of different things like that. Something I really like the flats for is wetting my paper before I do a wash and also doing a technique called side loading or double loading. And that would be like you load your brush with one color. So I'll get this yellow on there. I'll load that up. And then I'll get a corner of it in some green. And then when I paint on my paper, I can get a two-toned line. And that's really handy if you're painting a leaf. Say if I have a leaf here, I'll just do, load this up in light green and then dark green. And then I can have kind of a natural rim on my leaf. And if you have a good quality flat brush, those bristles are gonna stay together. Sometimes they wanna spread apart, especially if you've used your brush for acrylics and you've let paint dry in this metal part here called a ferrule, then those bristles go everywhere and you can never get that crisp straight line again. Can you use watercolor brushes for gouache? Yes, that's not gonna hurt them. Although you, make per you might prefer to use acrylic brushes for gouache because gouache is a little more viscous and um, the Golden Taclon acrylic brushes will push them around a little bit better. But the chemical makeup of gouache is the same as watercolor and you're not gonna hurt your watercolor brush. Um, so I'll show you a difference between a, um, a actual sable brush and a faux sable. Actually, I will do the sable tech here because that's mimicking more of a Kalinsky sable and that's what this is. So you'll see right off the bat that the actual sable brushes are not going to pull back quite as well as a faux sable. They're going to still, because they're, they're absorbing all that water. So you can see at the end how they're, how it's fuller. It's drunk up all that water. And so it is, it's reached its capacity and it's holding more in there. Where synthetic bristles, even the good ones that are meant to act like um, fur, they're still not going to be able to absorb quite that much. They'll swell up a little bit, but not as much because they're a slipperier material. They have like pits in the fibers that help them hold all of that, um, all of that paint, but it's not going to be quite as juicy as a sable. But I think for a flat, they do, you know, they definitely hold enough. And then I can make some lines on the chisel edge so you can see how fine of a line you can get. And I'll do the same with the sable. You can just see it. You can see that all that that water that's puddling, how much it's holding and how far you can go with it. And you can still get a pretty fine line. Is there a synthetic version of a hake brush or something that'll work like one? Hake brush. Um, I haven't seen any super fluffy ones before, but the, um, the Mimic line, the Mimic Squirrel has a two inch wide uh, brush right here that would be pretty similar. I would go for that. This is also part of the value pack for $30 that has those these two flats and all those rounds I just showed you. Um, I would give that a try. You really can't beat it. And these are not gonna shed. You're not gonna lose any of your um, any of your bristles. I'm just trying to feel them next to each other, next to the, like these have the same bristles as the Hake, the same type. They feel the same. They feel about the same softness. So I would say, I would say, yeah, that would be a good substitute. I thought a hake was a fish. <laughs> it is, right? Isn't it? <laughs> Maybe that's why they named the brushes hakes. Probably the Princeton Neptune as well. I'm just feeling this Mottler by uh, Princeton Neptune, and it feels about the same too. I think I think that would be a good substitution. Um, I'm trying to think. Is there anything? Is there anything anybody wants to see with the flat brushes while I have them out? Um, I'll do just a quick little. Um, Actually, I'll grab, a, I'll grab an angle. An angle brush is really handy, but it's essentially the same as a flat brush. Um, the thing I really like about the angles though, is that you've got that point. So if you're side loading, let's say I was going to paint a tree. Let me just draw a little tree in here. Let's say I was gonna paint a tree and the sun is shining over here. So I wanna put a shadow on this side of the tree. So with a, well, you can do this with a flat, absolutely the same. It's really no difference. You don't need both. However, when you have an angle brush, it's so easy to see where you're going to be putting your, uh, your color. I can even go with a wider one. 
I'll go with the wider one since I have a pretty big tree there. So what I would do is I'd mix up my color that I want. So let's do our regular uh, grade that we do with uh, burnt sienna and ultramarine blue. What do you think is more important, paint, brush, or paper in watercolor? Well, the brushes will last you forever. So if you're looking at where to invest, but uh, paper, hands down paper. <laughs> Although I'm a big, I'm a big believer in paint, paint, use what you have, but um, paper will make the biggest difference. So I made up my gray there. I'm going to clean my brush so it's empty. It's just wet and I'm going to blot it on my rag here. So I'm going to take off all the real shine. So it's just kind of lightly sheening just a little bit. Then I'm going to take my brush. I'm going to take the point end. You can see that the side that's sticking up longer. That's going to lay right into that paint. So I know that my paint is on the side with a point because with watercolor, it's, it's transparent and you can't always see where your color is. And granted, this isn't watercolor paper, but um, you can get the idea. So I was able to side load a uh, shadow on that tree and I don't get confused. Like even if I stop and I'm like, okay, I'm going to go up to this branch and side load that um, because of the point on my brush, I can remember where my color has been placed. So that's another um, great use of an angle brush. I love angles for that. Also with angle brushes, you can get in like to little nooks and crannies um, when you're painting. So you, cause you kind of have that point on its own and then you can use the whole flat of the brush. So angles are really handy and they're kind of like the sports car of your flat brushes. And Christine was asking about the triangular brush you're using on your Sunday post and how that works. Yeah, we're going to get to that when we get to the specialty brushes. Um, but any other questions on the flats? Uh, not seeing anything. Okay, so most of your brushes are either going to be a flat or a round or some version thereof. And the differences might be the length of the bristles, uh, the makeup of the bristles, or how stiff the bristles are. Um, so the next brush we're going to look at is... Um, is it's a type of round, or it could actually be a type of flat. They are called mop brushes. Now, personally, I don't use these very often. Um, my watercolor instructor recommended us to have mop brushes when I was a kid. She's a traditional painter. I think a lot more traditional painters use mop brushes because there weren't as many watercolor brushes available. Um, and these you could use for wetting your paper, for painting in soft skies, or to go in after on a wash and soften um, any harsh lines because these are so so soft they're like um they almost feel like a blush brush if you're a, a lady who wears makeup you know how that's how soft that is a really soft blush brush um so it's meant for softening i tend to use mops more for oil painting so probably most of these are going to go in my oil stash i'll save a couple for watercolor but um but i generally use them for oils and they come in a variety of different sizes another way you can tell if a brush is a watercolor brush um not all watercolor brushes have this but if your brush has a angle if it's cut to an angle like that um that's called an aquarelle handle and uh, that tells you it's a watercolor brush because that's meant for scraping into your paper to either scribe in lines or scrape out paint um so that's a that's a key sign you have a watercolor brush on your hands if you inherited some and uh, the next shape I'm going to look at is, again, kind of like a flat, kind of like a round. It's called either a filbert or a cat's tongue. So I showed you my favorite brush um, that I thought I lost, the cat's tongue here. So it's got a flat ferrule, but it comes to a point. So it's kind of like they took the bristles from a round brush and they squished the ferrule flat. So you end up with this um, kind of rounded end brush. This is also called a filbert, but usually in watercolor, it's called an oval wash, especially if it's large. This is handy for doing flower petals. Um, but again, this is the shape of brush. I generally use an oil painting because it's really good for blending, um, especially for floral painting and portraits. Did you have a, did they have a question? Nope. Oh, okay. I was just wondering if, yeah. so if that's the same as the round brush but flattened out, can you use the round brush the same way as that? Or? If your brush, if you have a round brush, it's not terribly pointy, like um, like those Cotman brushes that I showed you with the long, with the longer handles, brushes like this where you see they're not making a, a good point there. Um, those can be used very much like the, um, like the oval wash or the filberts. See, pretty much the same stroke. So think about that when you're adding to your collection, if that brush is going to just replicate something you already have. Now a round brush is going to have the advantage of holding a lot more paint because if you look at, even though that's about the same width, 
the they make the, a line about the same width this round brush has way more bristles in it look how fat the belly is there it's holding it's going to hold way more paint the bristles are also longer so it's going to hold way more paint so that's why your rounds are a little more useful as a watercolorist and the filberts are a little more useful if you are an oil painter or an acrylic painter because oftentimes rounds don't work that great in oils and acrylics because they don't have the push behind them um, so it's really hard to move that viscous paint but with watercolor you have the water that will help that paint move so um, rounds are, are almost useless well, I won't say almost useless but they're way less useful in acrylic and oils and heavier mediums where the filberts are fantastic and again they're made with different materials and pretty much every brush line is going to have them Joanna was asking if you could show them some uh, one stroke petals or leaves with the different brushes oh sure sure and I go into that in depth in my um, in my watercolor course. It's linked up with a coupon in the video description if you want to save 50% on it. We go through tons of flowers. I'm still adding to it, and um, uh, and it's a it's a great class if you want to practice brush strokes. So this I want to show you this uh, oval wash or filbert. It comes to a point because the bristles are longer and it's tapered tapered, so it will come to a point kind of like my cat's tongue. So when you see a brush referred to a cat's tongue, it means the bristles are going to come to a point. So if I wanted to do like a little rose or something, I would just load up my brush. I would start to make a few petals around, push my brush more as I went, and just kind of fill in with bigger petals towards the outside. This is probably a little too big of a brush for that. Showing up really good. Is it? No, it's not, is <laughs> no, it? No, it is. Oh, it is? It's, it's big. Oh. <laughs> and you could do that with any of your brushes, um, any of your, any of the different shapes, and they're all make, they're all going to make slightly different types of petals, and the paints will blend in differently depending on how absorbent the brushes are. And then we can move on to our specialty brushes, which are a lot of fun, especially if you like to do flower painting, and I'm going to move this out of the way. And I can show you some strokes, especially with that new triangle brush, because that's so much fun to play with. Um, so your specialty brushes are designed to create very specific effects. So I wouldn't consider getting specialty brushes until you've got a nice round, nice flat. You've got the basics because these are um, some of these can be kind of one trick ponies. So one brush that's kind of fun is the hake and the rake brush, especially if you like to do animals or feathers, anything where you want to have um, like little uh, individual furs or wisps of color. So these, if you can see when I've loaded it up, you can see those individual petals. This is a filbert uh, rake. These are really good for um, fur and I like that they're filbert ends so you don't get a really harsh start and stop to your lines. They're nice and soft. Great for dry brushing texture as well. If you've had a hard time getting the dry brushing um, effect that will give you a really good really good effect and here is a I'd say it's about a 3 8 inch and this is a flat so you do end up with a um, with a kind of a blunt end where the bristles start and stop and here we have a 1 inch or 3 quarter inch 3 quarter inch rake And then there's a relative to these brushes called a wisp. And those are generally used for acrylics, but I do have one here because I was using it. Um, even though it's an acrylic brush, I was using it with my watercolors. And it gives you more defined uh, stripes and streaks. And you can see that the bristles are much more, um, much more defined. There's big chunks taken out in between them instead of more of a softer um, flagging of the bristles there. So wisp and a rake. And I had people ask me about those the other day. So I wanted to get those in there. Um, you also have uh, fan brushes. And fan brushes can also be used for fur in splattering and uh, lots of different fun things. I do find the hog fan brushes to be a little bit, um, work a little bit better because the bristles don't want to clump together like the Taclon ones do. Or you might use it like if you're painting an ocean you might use it to do your ripples in the water. Again, this is a, the fan brushes were generally meant for oil painters for blending. 
I'll show you a hog one. I don't need to show you all of those. And uh, you can use, you don't have to have a specific um, fan brush for your watercolor. If you paint with like acrylics or oils and you want to just grab those in the, the events that you need them. But look how that just really effortlessly, effortlessly does the ripples in water. You know, you can totally just borrow that from whatever, whatever other stash you have. As is the case with these texture brushes. This is um, a type of foliage brush. This is a um, glass ceramic scruffy brush. This is in, let's see, I gotta, this is an angled foliage, which uh, I did leave in the water and all the paint is off of my brush, but since the ferrule's not wiggly, I just let it be. So don't leave your brushes in the water or get plastic handled brushes so that uh, you don't have to worry about that. I think that's another uh, Donna Dewberry brush there. Just any of these, uh, these scruffy brushes, these do texture. So do the Deerfoot Stiplers, and you can make your own Deerfoot Stippler by taking an old round brush and cutting it at an angle. So of course you just want to do that on an old brush that, you know, isn't any use to you anymore. So a Deerfoot Stippler does a shape that's like a Deerfoot, but it's really good for doing like baby's breath or pussy willows or any sort of uh, foliage like that. And these scruffy brushes are also really good for foliage. Depending on how wet your paint is, you'll either get um, more speckled uh, foliage or you'll get more dense foliage. So the wetter your brush is, the more dense your foliage will be. And these can come in different um, textures and different bristles, but I would recommend getting something that's stiff, either a synthetic hog or a real hog. And the angled ones give the advantage of being able to go on like the tip of, a br of the brush or use the whole flat of the brush. So you can go do little uh, dabs with the tip or you can push it more. And all of these work really well for spattering, but I also like to use an old toothbrush for spattering. So that's usually what I use, uh, but I could just show you that. So you can just draw your finger across some juicy paint and you can spatter it with these brushes. You get a more uniform, finer spatter with a brush like this versus a toothbrush, which is also in my special effects. Kate's asking if you were to paint with only one brush for the rest of your life, what brush would it be? Why? Uh, I think it would be, honestly, if I could only pick one brush, I would pick... What kind of world is this? I know. No, 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 <laughs> no world, world I want to live in. It would be <laughs> my number 12 Mimic... Um, Faux Squirrel Brush here by Creative Mark. That would be the one brush. The one brush to rule them all. <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's hard to beat a round. Rounds are just so versatile with watercolor. I'm just washing these brushes off so I don't leave them in the water overnight and forget about them. Okay, so the next couple brushes I want to show you are the dagger and the triangle brush. And... Um, these are fun. I have to say that um, the daggers that are meant for acrylics work a little bit better than the daggers that are meant for watercolors if you're doing uh, flowers. So if you look at this one, this could almost be a sword because it's it's uh, the bristles are so long. Um, a dagger, but the difference between a dagger and a sword is generally your dagger has shorter, it's an angle brush, but it's not, but it's got kind of like a, a swoop to the angle as opposed to a regular angle brush here, which is much less steep. It's a much shorter angle. So, and you've got a curve to it versus a straight angle. And um, a sword, which this one I believe is still called a dagger. I can't read the print is too small on that. Um, but a sword has longer bristles. So that's the big difference. You're gonna have more control with the shorter bristled version, just because like any brush, if the bristles are shorter, you'll have more control, but they hold less uh, paint and water. Um, but if you're doing flowers, I do recommend having a Taclon dagger versus having a faux fur dagger or a real fur dagger, just because you need a little more control and you need a little bit more stiffness. So it might be kind of fun to see the same, um, the same flower done in a, a synthetic dagger, a faux fur dagger and a angle brush, or at least the same petal, just so you can kind of see. So I'm going to start by mixing up just some really watery red so it's kind of like a pink and then I am going to so it's on my brush it's hard to see because the bristles are dark and then I'm going to get the tip of the brush into the concentrated paint 
Uh, so now I'm just going to wiggle my brush and make some petals. And this is the, the uh, angle brush. I'm going to uh, reload my brush. And I do this in my uh, in more depth in my watercolor class. So we get a couple petals there. Let's do those same petals with a dagger brush. I'm loading up the uh, watery red and I'm going to get the tip of my brush in the concentrated red. So already I can feel that it's holding more paint. And I'm overlapping, unfortunately. But I get a much more kind of spiky definition at the top and the bottom of my petals with that. And then if I was to do this one, this one's going to hold tons of water and paint. And look at how little it gets when I uh, add the water. And it's harder to control because it's so um, floppy and the bristles just don't want to hold their shape. You see that? I'm gonna clean my brush and reload it because it seemed to have a little bit of residual blue in there. Someone has pointed out that the dagger brush is also great for applying eyeshadow. Did you know that? No, I didn't. <laughs> she says, with eyeshadow, not watercolor. And you can see that my colors fled, floated right through the whole, all the bristles. They didn't stay as crisp as they did there. But the advantage of this natural dagger, well, not natural, it's, it's a faux fur, but it has the characteristics, is that if I want to make like grasses or anything like that, I can keep on painting. I don't have to, I don't have to reload because it holds so much. But I'm just not going to get the, um, the control that I'd want to get. You can do some really lovely long lines, but you need to have that space to move and you just don't have the control if you're trying to work in a small area. So, you know, you kind of have to weigh what you're looking for in a brush um, and then think about the materials that it's made out of and what's going to work best for you. I'm just going to fold this in half so I can work on the back side of this. Now the wedge brush is, uh, is quite a unique thing because um, we either have a flat ferrule or a round ferrule on most of our brushes, but these have a triangular ferrule. So if I hold this up, hopefully you can see, maybe if I hold it up like that, that the bristles come to a triangle. So it's actually kind of like a dagger brush without having a flat ferrule, it's having a triangular ferrule. And these are really fun for doing leaves and, and uh, petals. So I'm just going to load up my brush in some pink. And again, you can add a different color to the tip. And they just, it just gives you a very um, unique sort of petal. So if we're doing like five petal flowers. And you know, for it, this is a meant for an acrylic paint, it still holds quite a bit of paint and water. And the more you use it, the better it gets, the more absorbent it seems to get. But it does take a little practice. I thought my brushes were, were faulty when I got these. I was about to send them back. I'm like, man, every single, I brought, I bought like a bunch of different sizes to try them out. And I'm like, wow, they're all, they're all horrible, but it was just me. But you can get a really fine line. You can make long petals like you can with a dagger. Um, this is, it, but it acts very much like a dagger. So, uh, so if you have a dagger, you can do a lot of the same techniques. You can multi-load really easily. I'm just gonna load my, well, I'll show you how I do it. I'm gonna load up in yellow. Where'd you get this set? This, um, this brush right here, this is a number 12 by B-E-S-T-E. I found that at Jerry's Artorama and it was on sale for just under $3 and it's on clearance. So I don't know if they're getting rid of this particular 
uh, brush and I got the number eight size for like a dollar sixty something. So I went back and I ordered 20 of the number eights for classes after I got it and tried it and, and liked it because the regular price was like 30 on this and 18 on the other. So I thought it was a heck of a deal. Um, so you can double load. You got people's attention with these. Everybody's asking where you got them and all that. So, Oh, cool. Yeah, these are fun. I've been kind of obsessed with it. I'll show you my sketchbook. I've been doodling with these uh, brushes. What did I do with my sketch? Did you see where I set that big black sketchbook? No, I'll oh, wait, have a look. Oh, my gosh. What are they doing? It? Oh, it's made it on the floor. <laughs> right on here. the floor? floor. <laughs> There's a lot. I'm going to have to pick up brush carnage afterwards. I fall. I've dropped so many brushes. So that was just practicing. The first day I got the wedge brush, practicing with it. And um, I think some of those are mine. Oh, yes, you did a couple of those. Let's see. <laughs> I think that one's yours. <laughs> that one, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Which, do, you, do you see your, your flower? No, yeah. I don't know. Um, and then I did that one there. So that was just practicing and practicing and practicing. That because... wasn't mine? No, I don't think so. Oh, I don't right. think you contributed to that particular um, flower. And then I did use it in the live in the uh, sketchbook Sunday I did today. It's my boat painting for sure, though. <laughs> Let's see. I did those flowers with the, with the uh, wedge brush. And I did those with a wedge brush, a little um, delphinium. Because um, you can use all the different sides of it and come up with some really, uh, really cool, really cool things. So, um, yeah, that's definitely a lot of fun. And what did I do with it right here? I'm still getting used to it, though. And as soon as I feel like I've mastered it um, or gotten very gotten competent with it, I will do a... Um, I will do a section for the class on that. But like, you know, you can draw a little stem. The thing I like about the, the loose watercolors is florals is just like kind of using your imagination, making, making it up as you go along. But I like a brush that gives you those multiple angles. So you've got the, uh, the, the tip of it and you can get a really fine line, even with this number 12. I will do a... And then you can do... Well, the, Lindsay and Stereo. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of devices going around here. Yeah, we do. But it's just very meditative and therapeutic. So, yeah, if you're interested in these, I definitely would recommend picking them up at Jerry's Artorama while they're still still on clearance. I also got the... Um, I got the the ruby satin one, and I thought it's got to be the best because it was the most expensive. And maybe it is the best quality brush, but it's not meant for watercolors. None of those were meant for watercolors, but... Um, but they were the only triangle brushes I could find that weren't fur. And, um, and I had, I found this one to be the most difficult to use, but I do, I have seen other watercolorists use it and, and do a great job with it. So, you know, I think it, I think it's kind of what you're used to because it took me a while to get used to it. But once I got used to it, I was really pleased with what I was able to, to create, but it doesn't hold as much, um, as much watercolor as my as those two best brushes do so um you know use what you can get this one's also feels to be a little bit it's it feels a little smaller to me the ferrule seems to be about the same as the number eight this is the medium size silver ruby satin triangle brush um but even though these bristles are shorter is they still seem to hold a little bit more and they're more flexible this is more of a stiffer brush uh, but you know there are watercolors that use these and they do beautiful work so I think it's just a matter of you just practicing with whatever you have and you can get used to it but I mean I just really like the type of strokes that this brush makes and turn your paper while you're going were there any more questions about the triangle brush um, not specifically now I think you could probably do like a um like a type of one stroke or not one stroke but like a little kind of stroke work rose with it that's another thing practice the flowers that you paint but try them with different brushes and see how how they behave Someone was asking about um, her daughter bought bought her Royal and Langnickel black tackle on brushes. 
the value pack. She's just beginning to watercolor. Should she stick with those? A lot. Royal and Langle Nickel does make good brushes, but they also make a lot of um, of kind of kids grade brush brushes and economy brushes. So I don't know. I'm not very familiar with black Taclon. I'm thinking it might be um, kind of similar to those black bristles that are on like in like Crayola brushes that come with like the watercolor kits. So they might be a little too stiff. Um, but paint with them if they don't feel like they're too stiff. If they feel scratchy when you're painting, then they're probably too stiff for watercolor. Uh, look for a golden taclon. A golden taclon would be like the golden, the golden bristles, kind of like that, and uh, they're going to give you much better results. Um, I know if you, if you go to a craft store, you can probably get uh, Royal and Langnickel Menta or the uh, Lowell Cornell Comfort. Um, those work really well. Regency Gold by Winsor & Newton are great. I think, I'm not sure if they still make them though. I have quite a few, but I don't buy brushes that often uh, for watercolor because they last forever. But um, but those might, those, you know, try it. And if it doesn't, if it doesn't give you the results after doing some practice, then, then maybe upgrade. Another brush that I use a lot is a scrubber and um this one's actually called the maxine's mop and because it's that same shape as the other mops we were looking at but the use of these brushes in watercolor is lifting up your mistakes so what you would do is you would wet your brush you would blot the excess off and you would just scrub over an area you wanted to remove and then you would press over it with a clean paper towel and you would be able to kind of erase your mistakes a little bit um, this is drawing paper not watercolor paper but you kind of get the gist and let's see oh and i'll just show you very quickly what i have in my cup of brushes that are that go upstairs because i do have a table upstairs i paint at and um, i have two of those triangle brushes because i've been practicing with those a lot i have a small deerfoot stippler um, oh i have a quill this is an interesting brush i like this brush very much but um uh, I don't use it all that all that often because um, this is probably really silly. I should really try to find a. I know they do have a synthetic version of this, um, but because it is such a lovely brush, people ask about it, and I hate to say, yeah, it's a it's because it's a squirrel brush, and I've had that for like twenty years, and um, and I don't like to recommend purchasing fur brushes but um and they do make a synthetic one but i don't have any synthetic ones so i can't recommend a particular one so if i you know knew of one for sure and said oh yeah i get this one it's just as good then i would um but i mean it just makes beautiful lines of course because it is um fur it doesn't it's not going to snap right back it's going to bend over a little bit um but it still has really good control. And uh, a quill brush is identified by not having a metal ferrule. It's usually got like a, some sort of plastic. Um, and then it's got wire that holds it to the um, your wooden stick. Sometimes it's bamboo, some, usually some sort of wood. And, um, and that's how it's held in. It's a very fat, juicy brush. So it holds lots of liquid. Why are they made like that? Does it make them work differently? I somehow? think it makes the belly fatter so that it will hold more water. That's my, that's my thought because if kind you look, squeezing it all together. More. Yeah. And if you look closely, um, you can see a gap between the end of the handle and the, um, the, the, uh, bristles themselves. So I think it's just so they can pack in as many bristles. It looks like it's a muffin top brush. It's a muffin top brush. <laughs> yeah. It is. It is. Let me just hold it next to a round. And this is also, the sizing is different on these. Like this is considered a zero. And this is, so this is like a number eight round. You just see like the ed, the, the sides of the brush doesn't, don't bow, bow out on a regular round, even a faux synthetic round, or even, let me find a. What brand is that quill brush? This asking? is Windsor and Newton series 250. Pure squirrel. Uh, I'm just seeing if I have a, where can you get the Maxine's mop? Um, and you can see here, yeah, these, the brushes, the regular brushes, they just don't bow. They don't seem to bow out on the edges, even if they're wet. A Maxine's mop, I can't find the quarter inch ones anymore, but, um, the, there's a three eighths size and I've seen it for sale on Amazon. I've also seen it at artists. I think it's called artists friend magazine. Um, I have ordered from them in the past. I'm trying to think. That's the only places that I've seen it, but the new Menta scrubbers for watercolor are great and they're, they're, uh, 
much cheap. Well, actually, I don't know if they're much cheaper. I don't think that Maxine Pop was terribly expensive, but these are available at AC Moore, and hopefully they'll be available online soon. It's just that they're brand new. Uh, but I like this just as well because it's it's uh, stiff enough to scrub it away, but it's not so stiff that it will rip your paper. What you don't want to get are brushes that are called scrubbers because unless they're specifically for watercolor, uh, because they're generally too stiff and they will shred your paper, even good cotton paper, they'll just shred it. Um, yeah, I think that pretty much does it. My upstairs collection is just, um, just pretty much doubles. I did pick up another Deerfoot stippler when I was on Jerry's because I had a, a pretty good price on this best one. Um, I do like this line of brushes. They're meant for acrylics, but, uh, but they are really good quality. They have daggers as well. So if you're looking for a uh, not too pricey one, um, it's the B-E-S-T-E <laughs> is the name of it. And that's good. Oh, and this is an actual speckling brush. If you don't want to get your fingers dirty with um, with uh, a toothbrush or another brush, what you do is you wet this and you just scrub it into your paint. Pick up the uh, the color that you want, and you push. There's like a little needle on there, so you you like push the cork so that the needle goes into the bristles. And hopefully I don't spray myself. I'm, I don't know if you turn it away from yourself. Turn it away from yourself. So I'll be spraying <laughs> you, honey. <laughs> oh. And uh, and so you get your speckles that way. So if you don't want to get your fingers dirty with a toothbrush. My eye. <laughs> this will work. Um, it's not very expensive. It's a novelty. Um, you can pick them up for under $10, probably under 4 in a lot of places. Uh, and it's generally more sold for the toll painters. Most of the, the specialty brushes that we use for watercolor will be found in like your decorative painter um, supplies. So wherever you see like the bottles of acrylic, that's where you'd find those sort of supplies. And they're not very expensive, which is nice. So I think that goes through all of my brushes. What kind of brush would you use to sign your painting when you're done? I would use um, probably a liner or a spotter. So a spotter is, uh, it's like a, a tiny round, but it's got short hairs. So um, you can, you can have control. You can write, you don't get a very thick line. Yeah, so that, that works pretty well. Um, I tend to grab liners for a lot of things like that. You have less control, but you don't have to re-dip it so often. Oh yeah, you can get just this final line. And for the way I sign my name, I'm not doing cursive or anything. I'm just doing block letters. So that works fine for me. So this is a number, I think it's a zero probably. Oh, it's number one Royal Aqualon liner. So you can't really trust the sizes to be absolutely accurate between brands. That's the other thing. And also if you're looking at a long handled brush, brush versus a short handled brush, you're gonna have different sizing as well. So um, I'm wondering if this one has a number on it. No, that doesn't have a number. Brushes that have a width measurement, that's that's accurate. But if it says like number eight, number you know, 12, you think that would be millimeters, but it's not. If you have a number um, six in a long handled brush, it's gonna be twice as big as, as a six in a short handled brush for some reason. I'm not sure why, but people- I think people are having fun trying to pronounce squirrel quill. Squirrel quill. <laughs> Turn into squill. Squill, a <laughs> squill brush. So uh, is there anything else anybody wants to see? I don't know. The, question, I, the moderators are doing so awesome at just picking up a lot of the questions. And I think maybe I'll just doodle a few flowers because I did have somebody ask for that and I didn't feel like I was, I did a very, I was trying to get through the brushes and I don't feel like I was doing a very good job at that. So I think I'll grab this um, cat's tongue. Has this been just drawing paper the whole time? You yes. Say? Okay. Yeah. Just cheap. Uh, this is actually, this is really great. If you've got kids or you teach classes to children um, or you just want something cheap to practice on, this is Dick Blick's sulfite drawing paper and um, it is, it's really really fantastic. Um, it, does, it doesn't feather with the watercolor, so it's great for practicing your stroke work. And I'll use it for my kids' watercolor classes. It just does, it does a really nice job. Uh, so let's do like a little rose here. Start by just making some little C strokes. You got 334 people watching. Oh, nice. You got a hundred over a hundred thumbs up. Woo. If you haven't done the thumbs up, do the thumbs up, please. Oh yes, please thumbs up. So I'm just doing, these are C strokes because they look like the letter C. I'm going to add a little water to my brush so I can dilute my color a little bit. And those petals get a little bit lighter as they come out. I can even add a little bit of yellow in there if I want to. 
my brushes, my water's getting really gross. I did not pay attention when I was rinsing out some of my brushes. I don't have very much space in my palette. I need to mix over on my other palette here. Is there a certain brand you recommend for brush lettering that isn't a water brush? Um, yeah, I don't actually don't really recommend the water brushes. I mean, unless you just want the convenience of them for traveling, I don't find they get, they have as much, they're as good of, as a brush for like detail and whatnot. Um, for brush lettering, I think what, I, I think the, the, it, my instinct would be to go with a big juicy brush, but you actually want a smaller brush for brush lettering because when you press it to do your downstrokes, you're going to end up with, um, with really big, uh, really big wide strokes and it's not going to work that great. Ohuhu makes a um a black pen that's a brush pen that works pretty good. And uh trying to think. Um Tombow has a felt tip one that's that a lot of brush letterers use. The Zig and the Arteza real brush pens work really good for that. Um any of those I think if you want a colored marker that is that's that's not a brush. Probably for a brush Probably, I would probably say the, the Royal and Langnickel Sable Tech or Sable Line ones or Espressos, they're a little stiffer. I think those would probably give you a little more control. So I just did a, just a very quick little rose. I'm just going to tip it so it's not too shiny. And uh, let's do a flat brush leaf because those are kind of fun. I'm going to use a half inch flat. Just uh, use whatever you have. Actually, for flat, for flat brushes, if I'm doing any stroke work, I prefer a um, synthetic Taclon versus a faux fur, just because I feel like it, the bristles stay together really good, and you can get a lot of. Um, I'll move my palette over here so it's easier if you can see. Load up my brush. I think I have no idea how long we've been hanging out. <laughs> I'm loading it up with some light green. I'm just gonna get a little dark green. About an hour, a little over an hour now. Okay. And we still have people watching. Yeah, it's still growing, actually. So. Oh, that's awesome. Okay, hopefully I have enough water in my brush here. So I'm just going to do a little twist there so I get uh, like a half a heart. And do it on this side. I've got a nice little leaf right there. So that's two strokes for that leaf. And this would any any um, good quality Taclon brush made for like acrylic toll painting um, or watercolor would work fine for this. You don't have to have anything special. So it's just a push and a twirl and a lift. So something else that's really kind of fun. Let's give this, let's give this rose a stem. You can use your chisel edge on its side. That's really good if you shake. If you're, um, you have a hard time keeping your hand still uh, and your hand from shaking, you can rest your hand on your paper and pull it as long as you don't have anything wet on your paper. So that's really handy. Um, it's great for doing these long um, vines and strokes like that. And so, and if you want more rose help, I do a whole lesson that does uh, several different roses um, in my new class. So when you're doing your rose leaves, they match up. They are symmetrical. So I try to make sure I have enough room. If I'm going to put three on one side of my stem, that I have enough room to do three on the other. And then you just repeat that over there. Um, so, you know, you do not need a special brush. You don't need to spend a lot of money, but hopefully um, after today's live stream, you've got an idea of what makes a good quality, um, a good quality brush. You want to make sure that your bristles are, are, are staying together. You don't want bristles where like the, the bristles are going every which way. If you're at a local brush shop, oftentimes you can ask them for a cup of water to say, I want to buy this brush, but before I do, I just want to make sure the bristles are going to stay together. So you rinse off the sizing and see if they hold together like this when they're wet and then buy that brush. Don't put it back on the shelf and take one that has a collar on it. Take that one. Cause you know, that's a good one. Barbara's taking your watercolor course and says she highly recommends it. And she was saying that's half off till the end of the month. It's actually it's July fourth, though, right? Uh, is that, that what it was? End of the month. Never mind. You're right, Barbara. <laughs> well, actually, I tell you the truth, I do usually pad it a couple of days just in case for time zones and stuff. I don't like to. I don't like anyone to miss out. So um, maybe that was it. You probably told me that. Yeah, that's maybe, a secret. Maybe, maybe we'll do it till the fourth. 
That's a secret. <laughs> so you, a flat brush, super versatile. Another fun thing I like to do with a flat brush, and this was so fun because I did this in Heirloom, um, West Springfield, and it was so fun to see people when they got this this stroke because the stroke once you get it, it's once you get it you won't unget it. It's like riding a bike. So you make you take your flat brush and you make a line, and then you hold your brush at a forty five degree angle from the stem, right? So the edge of your brush is making that 45 degree angle. And look at how pretty that is. It's kind of like what we were doing with the wedge brush or the triangle brush. It's also called a wedge or a pyramid, just in case um, you're having a hard time finding it. I had a heck of a time to find mine. But isn't that, I mean, you can just doodle that motif for days in your sketchbook, have fun and you know, create some really beautiful concepts and motifs. And I think we should try this with a wedge brush too, just so we can see the difference. So let's grab our wedge brush and see what that, see how that does. It's a question. Mm. If you have a flat brush that likes to split in the middle, is there anything you can do to keep from doing that? Or is it uh, done what, for? What I would recommend, um, if your brush is having a problem like that, and hopefully it's completely, first check to make sure it's not clean. Make, uh, make sure it is clean. Make sure your kids didn't borrow it. And you know, they got some acrylic paint in the ferrule and some dried in there and it split. If you suspect that there's some paint dried in there, it wouldn't be watercolor. It would be acrylic or something like that. You see like maybe a little bit of residue down here. Cause if it's splitting in the middle, you probably have a little dried something in there. Then I would soak the brush in rubbing alcohol overnight. And that rubbing alcohol dissolves acrylic paint. It is not the best thing to do for your brushes, but if your brush is already giving you trouble like that, then it's not really useful the way you have it. So soak it in a, in a in alcohol overnight, then wash it with brush cleaner. And I recommend brush cleaner like the old master. I think, no, is it called the masters? I believe it's called the masters. It's in a little brown cake. And um, if you don't have that, you could use lava soap, but the masters has a chemical in it. It does good at old, like, dissolving old paint. And then I would boil a cup of, boil a pot of water, take it off the stove, dip your brush in that boiling water, hold it for like 30 seconds, pull it out, let it drip dry. Um, I would just go like that. But if your fingers are sensitive, maybe put a glove on or something and you just want to squeeze out that, um, that water, add dish soap to your fingers, add the soap to your brush so that you're like gelling it up, kind of like hair gel, you're gelling it up with the soap and let it dry completely overnight. Then when you go back to it and you wash out the sizing, your brush, if it's going to go back to the way it should, that will do it. If it doesn't go back after that, chop it off and use it as a foliage brush because <laughs> <laughs> something has happened to that brush. I would probably, one of your children has gotten hold of it and painted it with acrylics with it. Um, okay. So we're going to play with that with a wedge brush. We're going to do the same thing, but with a wedge. Um, and I've done that. That does work. I mean, it's, it's always best to take care of your brush, but you know, things happen. So maybe somebody in your family grabs it and uses it for something they shouldn't. <laughs> Doesn't know what it's meant to be used for to begin with. Yeah. Yeah. That's what you put washi tape or something on all the ends of your watercolor <laughs> brushes, watercolor only. I have my, my uh, fabric, my fabric scissors have a, have a ribbon on the end. So everyone knows don't use that for wrapping paper or anything else. Oh, that's what that means. <laughs> this proof there's this audio proof that you know what the, that that's what that means uh so with our with our triangle brush we're going to pull out a fine line with the tip of it because see how it, it's almost like a liner at the tip it's a tiny tiny little uh, little shape and then um we are going to make this very similar petals i have to stop and think about it when i'm switching brushes you could do a scissors video someday oh maybe Drag those all out. I don't feel like I have that many scissors. I know, I, have, you, I know you don't feel like you do. I have a lot of the same, I have a lot of <laughs> duplicates of the same scissors that I like. <laughs> My decoy scissors for you guys to use and the good ones <laughs> that I hide away. <laughs> we get the rusty ones that you get used to pry things open with. <laughs> you get the tennis shot needed scissors. <laughs> I'm going to go, I'm going to try that smaller triangle brush too. That was a 12. That made pretty big petals. Go the smaller one here and see how that one does. Oh, here comes your kitty cat. I don't know if that came out on the microphone or not. Right there. So when you're using the triangle brush, I like to put it down so the flat side of the triangle is down. The point is on the top peak. I'm still keeping that pie shape, that pie shape between my brush and the stem. This just gives you more of like a chunkier petal. And I do have a harder, harder time like uh, mirroring it with the uh, triangle brush than I would with a flat brush. 
but it's definitely fun and good to practice your brush control. I like the flat brush ones better, but it could just be that I have just been playing with a triangle brush for a week, so I don't really 100% know what I'm what I'm doing, but um, but it's it's a lot of fun to play with. And then you can also use your dagger brushes. So this is something else. Um, or if you maybe you bought the uh, the floppier ones um, by mistake and you and you're kind of bummed because you can't do the techniques you wanted to do. These are great for swirls uh, or for like twigs, lines, things like that. Use it at a 90 degree angle. You're not going to have as much control as you would with a liner with this, but you can do a lot of different swirls and things like that. So just practice with what you have and see the different marks that you can make with your brushes. You can do leaves with your daggers as well. And uh, just make sure you turn your paper because with these specialty brushes, especially, you seem to need to have a little bit more, um, a little bit more maneuvering room here. I was but, asking what where your palette came from, what that, brand that is. That's a Zoltan Zabo palette, and um, I'm planning a palette video. It might be a live stream like this. You can let us know whether you like the idea of the format of the live stream or just go through it straight. Um, but this is uh, this is neat because it has a lid that you can use for mixing. Um, I got this when I originally got my Turner watercolors because I needed something to put those in. And then um, I used those up for the most part. And I had some Yarka paints that had dried in the tubes. So I cut the tubes off and I plopped them in here. Um, so it's kind of a hot mess looking, but uh, it's really functional. And um, honestly, if I, your best bet is to just put paint in these smaller wells and use the larger wells for mixing. But I just needed a house for those paints and I didn't have an empty palette that would fit them. So, um, so that's the story with that. I think, I think we've gone through pretty much everything here. Any last minute questions? Pretty well caught up, I guess. All right. Wonderful. Well guys, thank you so much for watching. The replay will be available after the stream. And, um, if you have any questions that we didn't get to, you can leave them in the comments below and I'll do my best to answer them all. Please give me a thumbs up before you go. And if you want more information on stroke work, um, check out my watercolor classes, the floral one that I just released. It's 50% off, does a lot with stroke work. So, um, hopefully that will be useful to you. And I think that's all I have to say. Do you have anything to add? Your husband is not an artist, too. Someone <laughs> just asked. Oh, he's creative, though. <laughs> all right, guys. Thanks so much for watching. Until next time, happy crafting.